Hello friends. Today I am reading, and even though it's backwards, I am reading um, chapter 10 from Howl's Moving Castle by Diana Wynne Jones. Um, if you want to see chapters one through nine, you would go to my Instagram page, which is at Miss Hamilton fourth grade. Um, from here on for the rest of the book, I'm going to be reading it here on YouTube. So let's go ahead and get started. Chapter 10, in which Calcifer promises Sophie a hint. Hal must have come back while Sophie and Michael were out. He came out of the bathroom while Sophie was frying breakfast on Calcifer and sat gracefully in the chair, rooming and glowing and smelling of honeysuckle. Dear Sophie, he said, always busy. You were hard at work yesterday, weren't you, in spite of my advice? Why have you made a jigsaw puzzle of my best suit? Just a friendly inquiry, you know. You jellied it the other day, said Sophia, making it over. I can do that, said Howell. I thought I showed you. I can also make you a pair of seven league boots your own size, if you give me your size. Something practical and brown calf, perhaps. It's amazing the way one can take a step ten and a half miles long and always, still always land in a cow pat. It may have been a bull pat, said Sophie. I dare say you found mud for the marshes on them too. A person my age needs a lot of exercise. You were even busier than I realized then, said Howell. Because when I happened to tear my eyes from Letty's lovely face for an instant yesterday, I could have sworn I saw your long nose poking around the corner of the house. Mrs. Fairfax is a family friend, said Sophie. How was I to know you'd be there too? You have an instinct, Sophie, that's how, said Howell, and nothing is safe from you. If I were to court a girl who lived on an iceberg in the middle of an ocean sooner or later, probably sooner, I'd look up to see you swooping overhead on a broomstick. In fact, by now I'd just be disappointed if I didn't see you. Are you off to the iceberg today? Sophie retorted. From the look on Letty's face yesterday, there's nothing that need to keep you there. You wrong me, Sophie, Hal said. He sounded deeply injured. Sophie looked suspiciously sideways. Beyond the red jewel swinging in Hal's ear, his profile looked sad and noble. Long years will pass before I leave Letty, he said. And in fact, I'm off to see the king again today. Satisfied, Mrs. Nose? Sophie was not sure she believed a word of this, though it was certainly to Kingsbury with the door not the doorknob read down that Hal departed after breakfast, waving Michael aside when Michael tried to consult him about the <laughs> consult him about the perplexing spell. Michael, since he had nothing to, to do, left as well. He said he might as well go to Cesare's. Sophie was left alone. She still did not truly believe what Hal had said about Letty, but she had been wrong about him before, and she had it only in Michael. Michael and Calcifer's word for Hal's behavior after all. She collected, collected up all the little blue triangles of cloth and began guiltily sewing them back into the silver fishing net, which was all that was left of the suit. When someone knocked at the door, she started violently, thinking it was the scarecrow again. Port Haven door, Calcifer, Calcifer said, flickering a purple grin at her. That should be all right then. Sophie hobbled over and opened it, blew down. There was a cart horse outside. The young fellow of 50 who was leading it wondered if Mrs. Witch had something which might stop it casting shoes all the time. I'll see, said Sophie. She hobbled over to the grate. What shall I do, she whispered. Yellow powder, fourth jar along on the second shelf, Calcifer whispered back. Those spells are mostly belief. Don't look uncertain when you give it to them. Sophie poured, ye poured yellow powder into a square of paper as she had seen Michael do, twisted it smartly and hobbled to the door with it. There you are, my boy, she said. That'll stick the shoes on harder than, it, than any hundred nails. Do you hear me, horse? You won't need a smith for the next year. That'll be a penny, thank you. It was quite a busy day. Sophie had to put down her sewing and sell, with Calfifer's help, a spell to unlock drains, another to fetch goats, and something to make good beer. The only one that gave her any trouble was the customer who pounded on the door in Kingsbury. Sophie opened it red down to find a richly dressed boy, not much older than Michael, white-faced and sweating, wringing his hands on the doorstep. 
Madam Sorceress, for pity's sake, he said. I have to fight a duel at dawn tomorrow. Give me something to make sure I win. I'll pay any sum you ask. Sophie looked over her shoulder at Calcifer, and Calcifer made faces back, meaning that there was no such thing ready-made. That wouldn't be right at all, Sophie told the boy severely. Besides, dueling is wrong. Then just give me something that lets me have a fair chance, the lad said desperately. Sophie looked at him. He was very undersized and clearly in a great state of fear. He had that hopeless look a person has who always loses at everything. I'll see what I can do, Sophie said. She hobbled over to the shelves and scanned the jars. The red one labeled cayenne looked the most likely. Sophie poured a generous heap of it on the square of paper. She stood the human skull beside it. Because you must know more about this than I do, she muttered at it. The young man was leaning anxiously round the door to watch. Sophie took up a knife and made what she hoped would look like mystic passes over the heap of paper. You are to make it a fair fight, she mumbled. A fair fight, understand? She screwed the paper up and hobbled to the door with it. Throw this in the air when, you, when the duel starts, she told the undersized young man. And it will give you the same chance as the other man. After all, whether you, after that, whether you win or not depends on you. The undersized young man was so grateful that he tried to give her a gold piece. Sophie refused to take it. So he gave her a two-penny two penny bit instead and went away whistling happily. I feel a fraud. Sophie said as she stowed the money under the hearthstone. But I would like to be there at that fight. So would I, crackled Calcifer. When are you going to release me so that I can go and see things like that? When I've got even a hint about this contract, Sophie said. You may get one later today, said Calcifer. Michael breezed in towards the end of the afternoon. He took an anxious look round to make sure Hal had not come home first and went to the bench. When he got things out to make it look as if he had been busy, singing cheerfully while he did. I envy you being able to walk all that way so easily, Sophie said, sewing a blue triangle to a silver braid. How was my, my niece? Michael gladly left the workbench and sat on the stool by the hearth to tell her about his day. Then he asked about Sophie's. The result was that when Hal shouldered the door open with arms full of parcels, Michael was not even looking busy. He was rolling around the stool, laughing at the dual, at the dual spell. Hal backed into the door to shut it and leaned there in a tragic attitude. Look at you all, he said. Ruin stares me in the face. I slave all day for you. And not one of you, even Calcifer, can spare time to say hello. Michael sprang up guiltily and Calcifer said, I never do say hello. Is something wrong? asked Sophie. That's better, said Hal. Some of you are pretending to notice me at last. How kind of you to ask, Sophie. Yes, something is wrong. The king has asked me to officially find his brother for him, with a strong hint that destroying the Witch of the Waste would come in handy too. And, all, and you all sit there and laugh. By now it was clear that Hal was in a mood to produce green slime any second. Sophie hurriedly put away her sewing away. I'll make you some hot butter toast, she said. Is that all you can do in the face of tragedy? Hal asked. Make toast? No, don't get up. I've trudged here laden with stuff for you so that the least you can do is show polite interest. Here. He tipped a shower of parcels into Sophie's lap and handed another to Michael. Mystified, Sophie unwrapped things. Several pairs of silk stockings, two parcels of the finest chambric petticoats and with flounces, lace, and satin insets. <clears throat> a pair of elastic-sided boots in dove gray suede, a lace shawl, and a dress of gray-watered silk, to, <laughs> sorry, gray-watered silk, trimmed with lace that matched the shawl. Sophie took one professional look at each and gasped. The lace alone was worth a fortune. She stroked the silk of the dress, awed. Michael unwrapped a handsome new velvet suit. You must have spent every bit that was in the silk purse, he said ungratefully. I don't need this. You're the one who needs a new suit. Hal hooked his boot into what remained of the blue and silver suit and held it up ruefully. Sophie had been working hard, but it was still more whole than suit. How selfless I am, he said. 
but I can't send you and Sophie to blacken my name to the king in rags. The king wouldn't would think I didn't look after my old mother properly. Well, Sophie, are the boots the right size? Sophie looked up from her odd stroking. Are you being kind, she said, or cowardly? Thank you very much, and no, I won't. What ingratitude, Hal ex exclaimed, spreading out both arms. Let's have green slime again, after which I'll, she'll be forced to move the castle a thousand miles away and never see my lovely Letty again. Michael looked at Sophie imploringly. Sophie glowered. She saw well enough that the happiness of both her sisters depended on, depended on her agreeing to see the king, with green slime in reserve. You haven't asked me to do anything yet, she said. You just said I'm going to. Hal smiled. And are you and you are going to, aren't you? All right. When do you want me to go? Sophie said. Tomorrow afternoon, said Michael. Said Hal. Michael can go as your footman. The king's expecting you. He sat on the stool and began explaining very carefully and soberly just what Sophie was to say. There was no trace of the green slime mood. Now things were going Hal's way, Sophie noticed. She wanted to slap him. I want you to do a very delicate job, Hal explained, so that the king will go on giving me work, like the transport spells, but not trust me with anything like finding his brother. You must tell him how I angered the witch of the ways and explain what a good son I am to you, but I want you to do it in such a way that he'll understand I'm really quite useless. Hal explained in in great detail, Sophie clasped her hands around the parcels and tried to take it all in, though she could not help thinking, if I was the king, I wouldn't understand a word of what the old woman was driving at. Meanwhile, Michael was hovering at Hal's elbow, trying to ask him about the perplexing spell. Hal kept thinking of new, delicate details to tell the king and waving Michael away. Not now, Michael. And it occurred to me, Sophie, that you might want some practice in order to not find the palace overwhelming. We don't want you coming over queer in the middle of the interview. Not yet, Michael. So I arranged for you to pay a call on my old tutor, Mrs. Pentsemon. She's a grand old thing. In some ways, she's grander than the king. So you'll be quite used to that kind of thing by the time you get to the palace. By this time, Sophie was wishing she had never agreed. She was heartily relieved when, Mike, when Hal at last turned to Michael. Right, Michael, now your turn. What is it? Michael waved the shiny gray paper and explained in an unhappy rush how impossible the spell seemed to do. Hal seemed faintly astonished to hear this, but he took the paper saying, Now, where was your problem? And spread it out. He stared at it. One of his eyebrows shot up. I tried it as a puzzle, and I tried doing it just as it says, Michael exclaimed. But Sophie and I couldn't catch the falling star. Great gods above, Hal exclaimed. He started to laugh and bit his lip to stop himself. But Michael, this isn't the spell I left you. Where did you find it? On the bench, in that heap of things Sophie piled around the skull, said Michael. It was the only new spell there, so I thought. Hal leaped up and sorted among the things on the bench. Sophie strikes again, he said. Things skidded right and left as he searched. I might have known. No, the proper spell's not here. He tapped the skull thoughtfully on its brown, shiny dome. You're doing, friend? I have a notion you, co you come from there. I'm sure the guitar does. Er, Sophie, dear? What, said Sophie. Busy, old fool, unruly Sophie, said Hal. Am I right in thinking that you turned my doorknob black side down and stuck your long nose out through it? Just my finger, Sophie said with dignity. But you opened the door, said Hal, and the thing Michael thinks is a spell must have got through. Didn't it occur to either of you that it doesn't look like spells you usually do? Spells often look peculiar, Michael said. What is it really? Hal gave a snort of laughter. Decide what this is about. Write a second verse. Oh, Lord, he said and ran for the stairs. I'll show you, he called as his feet pounded up them. I think we wasted our time rushing around the marshes last night, Sophie said. Michael nodded gloomily. Sophie could see he was feeling a fool. It was my fault, she said. I opened the door. What was outside? Michael asked with great interest. 
but Hal came charging down the stairs just then. I haven't got that book after all, he said. He seemed upset now. Michael, did I hear you say you, you went out and tried to catch a shooting star? Yes, but it was scared stiff and fell in a pool and drowned, Michael said. Thank goodness for that, said Howell. It was very sad, Sophie said. Sad was it, said Howell. More upset than ever. It was your idea, was it? It would be. I can just see you hopping around the marshes encouraging him. Let me tell you, that was the most stupid thing he's ever done in his life. He'd have been more than sad if he'd had if he chanced to catch the thing. And you... Calcifer flickered sleepily up the chimney. What's all this fuss about, he demanded. You caught one yourself, didn't you? Yes, and I... Hal began turning his glass marble glare on, on Calcifer. But he pulled himself together and turned to Michael instead. Michael, promise me you'll never try to catch one again. I promise, Michael said willingly. What is that writing if it's not a spell? Hal looked at the gray paper in his hand. It's called Song, and that's what it is, I suppose. But it's not all here, and I can't remember the rest of it. He stood and thought as if a new idea had struck him, one which obviously worried him. I think the next verse was important, he said. I better take it back and see. He went to the door and turned the knob black down. Then he paused. He looked around at Michael and Sophie, who were naturally enough both staring at the knob. All right, he said. I know Sophie will squirm through somehow if I leave her behind, and that's not fair to Michael. Come along, both of you, so I've got you where I can keep my eye on you. He opened the door on the nothingness and walked into it. Michael fell over the stool in his rush to follow. Sophie shed parcels right and left into the hearth as she sprang up. Don't let any sparks get on those, she heard, said hurriedly to Calcifer. If you promise to tell me what's out there, Calcifer said. You had your hint, by the way. Did I, said Sophie. She was in too much of a hurry to attend. And that's the end of the chapter. The next chapter will be in which Howell goes to a strange country in search of a spell. And so we'll see you for that one. Have a great day. Bye.